Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Sarah Jandrisic. It is noon, so I think we're going to get started with our webinar on Thrips Parvus Spinus um, Potential Solutions. This is a webinar um, from people who have been trying to work with growers directly in the field to try and solve this problem uh, with a bit of a slant on biocontrol, but I'm also going to talk about pesticides. So I'm really happy you can all join us today to talk about this interesting invasive pest. Um, just a little bit more about the uh, Grow On series that you're watching today, if my slide will advance. There we go. Uh, Grow On is our webinar series by the Ontario government uh, greenhouse team. Um, so the four of us, we cover production and IPM of both greenhouse vegetables and greenhouse floriculture crops. You can find more about us and what we do and about the webinars on on greenhousevegetables.ca, the ON is for Ontario, get it, on greenhouse vegetables, and on floriculture.com for the floriculture side of things. And um, if you go to our blogs and subscribe, um, you'll get emails sent to your inbox about our upcoming webinars and other content that's related to production and pest management. Um, we won't inundate you, we promise. It's about uh, maybe three a post a month. So I encourage you all to do that. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And um, the lovely Kara McCreary, which is my partner in Greenhouse Vegetables, is going to um, do a bit of housekeeping and introduce all the speakers besides myself. Hey, welcome to today's webinar. Um, also, so I'm Kara McCreary, as Sarah mentioned, Sarah's counterpart in Greenhouse Vegetables. Um, so just a couple housekeeping um, things that I want to bring to your attention. I'm sure you're all familiar with this by now. Um, but if you have questions directly to um, speakers, please type them in the Q&A. If, um, if you have any technical issues, I'm happy to try and help with those, but I'd um, just ask that you type them in the chat. So questions for speakers in the Q&A, technical issues in the chat. Okay, so today we have three great speakers. Um, the first is Suzanne Wainwright Evans um, from Bug Lady Consulting. For the past 25 years, Suzanne has provided expert horticultural and entomological advice to the industry. She specializes in biological control, IPM, pesticides, biopesticides, organics, and sustainable pest management. Her crop focuses include ornamentals, cannabis, hemp, and herbs and vegetables. Our next speaker will be Stephen Arthurs, who's the technical sales specialist at BioB USA. Dr. Arthurs is an entomologist with over 20 years academic and industry experience in arthropod pest management and plant protection. Stephen's current work focuses on implementing and expanding the use of beneficial arthropods in both horticultural and open field crops. And our final speaker for today will be Sarah Jan Dresek, who's the Greenhouse Floriculture IPM Specialist with OMAFRA. Dr. Sarah Jan Dresek has worked in floriculture IPM for over 25 years in academia, industry, and government. Her work focuses on long-term economical solutions for both pests and diseases plaguing floriculture growers. So now I'm going to hand it over to Suzanne, who will start the webinar. You see that okay? Yep, it looks good. Okay, thanks. Well, thanks everybody uh, for coming today um, for this webinar. Sarah and I have been talking quite a bit about this thrips over the last, uh, well, quite a while um, because it, it has been quite a challenge um, to deal with. But one of the things that a few of us have been discussing is about how to get some information about out about a little bit more applied management. There's been some absolute phenomenal uh, pesticide research that has been done. Alexandra down at the University of Florida has done some really great initial spray trial work to give us a, a baseline. But I think that overall looking at the larger picture, we need to look overall at the overall management strategies of this pest. 
So for this pest, I'm going to walk through a few things. One, I tried not to repeat information that's been given in other webinars because there have been several webinars lately. But, you know, this is a thrip species we're talking about. Um, and this does thrips beans fringed wings. And with going through thrips identification, one of the things you look at is, is the wings, the antenna, and a lot of structures. Um, so understanding how to ID identify them is really important. Um, it's interesting when you start, you know, tootling around the internet and talking to people about where this pest currently is, because it doesn't really match up for most of us that know really where this pest is these days. Um, we do know it originated in Southeast Asia, and then it is kind of spread to other uh, countries. Um, it was detected in Florida in 2020, and then it was also detected up in Canada in 2021. Um, you know, there's always finger pointing going on about how things move around. Um, I am sure commercial plant movement had to do with this, but I also do think over time with the home hobby house plant uh, industry, we're going to see more movement uh, with this particular pest through there because commercial growers are inspected and regulated and have protocol, but there's very little um, oversight on the home hobbyist plant trade, which is, is is very large these days for tropical foliage. So I do think we have to be aware um, that this, this pest has a lot of potential to move through numerous chains. Now, how do we find this thrips? So uh, first and foremost, if you're out in your facility, usually what people notice is plant damage. Leaf distortion is the main thing initially for this particular pest. Um, in some situations with blooms, we can get a little bloom discoloration, but I'm not seeing at the levels that you would see that with Western flower thrips. Another way you can look for this is sticky cards, which is something Sarah has been uh, working on uh, quite heavily using sticky cards for uh, not only mass trapping, but monitoring thrips populations. Also, just taking your plant and banging it over a black or white sheet of paper kind of depends on how your eyes work. This is a little bit darker with rip, so white may be a little better for it to be able to see it. Another way to find it is washing plant leaves or growth tips. This is something also Sarah and I have been talking about. And actually, uh, this December, Sarah and I are going to be teaching a class in Michigan, a hands-on day workshop. And one of the things we're going to be teaching is this 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 skill about how you can take growth tips or cuttings and wash them and then pour that water through either filter paper, cellulose paper, coffee filters, and things like that to be able to look for thrips. This is something you can do uh, for this particular thrip species on incoming plant material is ch uh, cutting the growth tips and rinsing them either in water or alcohol, and again, pour them through even a coffee filter, and you can then see the thrips in there because they're very visually hard to detect, those early instars just on the foliage. Now, as far as seeing them, um, I know many of you know uh, through years, I absolutely love the Dynalite. Um, that has been one of my key tools out in the field. There are knockoff Dynalites, um, like the one on the right that you can get from Amazon. Sarah recently has introduced me to this new um, magnification tool that goes on your smartphone, and I've had challenges with any of these clip-on scopes have not worked. I literally have a box of them. This is the first one that I've actually been impressed with so far because it's very adjustable depending on your camera. Um, and I think this has a lot of potential and we're talking about using them um, uh, to look at thrips on sticky cards and the photos Sarah's taken with this new tool are very good. So I think that's another tool option for the toolbox. So many of you know um, about this thrips. There's this pest alert that's been around for a while now. Um, and you can get some of the basic information on the, the pest here. There are some photos uh, that have come from Florida Department of Agriculture. The only thing that I don't really care for about the photos they use here is the females on the left, the males on the right, and it makes you think that the males are these giant thrips compared to the females. Actually, the males are much smaller than the females, and it's just the way the images have been cropped um, in this this hand the this information sheet there. 
So what I kind of did is I tried to scale my images a little more appropriately here. So uh, that is the female on the left and the male on the right. Um, the female, basically, this is how we are quick field ID of Thrips Privy Spinus, the top half-ish um, to third is lighter color, and then it has the darker abdomen on its body. Also, if you look between the eyes, you have the red CD in there. The males are smaller and much more yellow in color. And at quick glance out in the field, just real quick, they kind of remind me a bit of chili thrips out when I see them. But the only good thing about them, I could say, is that when you do see them and mandevilla diplodemia are a good place to find them and you just look down the throat and the flower you can readily see them sitting right in there so they're pretty easy to find um again what i like to do with blooms um is you can breathe into them and then you can actually force the thrips to kind of come out of the blooms. Um, yes, we've seen Western flower thrips in Mandevilla before, but these are much darker and have much higher numbers uh, than what we've seen with Western flower in the past. But again, looking at them, lighter top, darker bottom. I think this is one of the key things. Now there are some other thrip species that can look like this, but for what we're seeing in tropical foliage, this one looks very different than the other key pests you may see in, in the foliage plants. Um, now, you can get them confused possibly with a few other things. Again, Western flower thrips, eh, not so much, even though we can have color variations in Western flower. Western flower is just overall lighter in color and not so two-tone. Without a hand lens and a quick glance, possibly soybean thrips, which we see coming into a lot of greenhouses um, during the summer months. Um, but when you get in closer and look, you can see that's almost striped across. The one that we mostly get confused with is the echinothrips. Echinothrips um, do have the lighter spots in the wing. Their pupil stage, which they pupate on the leaf, is much lighter in color but their damage is very different. Um, echinothrips damage is almost like spider mite damage. You get more of a stippling kind of look to it. But here I wanted to put these two thrips again next to each other so you can see them. The parvi spinus is on the left, poinsettia thrips, AKA echinothrips on the right. And we do know growers have mistakenly identified echinothrips as this, the echinothrips. So it is important to get in there and look. The other thing with the echinothrips is if you look right where basically the front half of their body kind of connects with the back half, you can see kind of reddish in between there. And they almost look like they're wearing a red necklace. That's another diagnostic tool that you can use to tell them apart. And also echinothrips have black heads. The parvi spinous have a lighter colored head. So, um, you know, by looking at them with a hand lens under magnification, you can see the difference. Also, they're, like I said, their damage is different. You know, the poinsettia thrips is more like spider mites. The uh, pepper thrips, we're going to see some examples here. So if you do need help with identification, um, Sarah um, and Ashley up in Canada have put together this amazing key if you have an old version, make sure you get the new version because they've added the parvi spinous thrips into the newer version. It's on the greenhouseipm.org website. And this key is designed to help growers identify the most common, and I'm gonna give you the air coat, Canadian-ish, that part of the country world. This may not always work with the growers in the South because we do have a few other thrips down in the South. They don't, they still don't have in the North, um, amazingly. But this will get you to how to tell Western flower, uh, echinothrips, uh, parvi spinous, and all those main ones uh, apart. That's a great tool. Also, um, the University of Wagnon, and I can never pronounce that right. I'm butchering it. Um, we need uh, one of our Dutch friends here to pronounce it correctly. They have a very good Thrips ID poster um, available free from their website. If you uh, just Google this up and the university name down in the lower left corner and Thrips um, ID card or Thrips 
poster, you can find it. And they have revised it since the earlier version, adding in this Thrips Parvi Spinus in there, which adds, you know, actual photos, immatures, damage, and then the different anatomy for when they are slide mounted. I highly recommend downloading the current version of that also to help with identification. So as far as host plants go, it just, you, Google it. I mean, I'm starting to think every plant's going to be on this list. Um, it kind of is more on tropical plants and plants that can't handle a hard freeze because this is a tropical thrips. Um, so we don't see it overwintering outside up north. The question is, is where's the line going to be? Because they don't recognize like the Mason-Dixon line and they're not going to be like, oh, we can't cross that. We may have it march a little further north up the, you know, eastern seaboard. We just don't know yet. Um, but the host list is expanding. Um, we haven't seen it on everything that is on the host plant list. Um, I think sometimes it has to do with food choices and availability. Uh, and it does seem to really prefer certain things. I, I think that mandevillas, diplodemias, and peppers, uh, gardenias are some of its most favorite food choices out there. Now the damage. This is where it can get a little tricky, but doesn't have to be. Um, it can look like broad mite damage. And I think possibly, because um, we have been dealing with a lot of broad mite issues the last few years, that sometimes when people think they had broad mite, because broad mite has been a problem, that possibly they've had this thrips and didn't realize it. Um, and then we're treating it as it was a mite but possibly didn't get the control they expected. And that's why people said they were struggling with broad mites. The reason why this damage looks like broad mite is because with this thrips, what it's doing is, and I'm not gonna say every crop, I'm gonna go with most crops because there's always exception, it's laying its eggs in the new growth tip. So in those first instars first start emerging, those early non-flying baby thrips are gonna be feeding on those new growth tips. and when I'm out there with my hand lens looking at the plants, the new growth tips are where we find these early instars. And then that is what causes this distortion on the plant. And then those leaves expand. Here I wanted to show you a comparison of the Thrips Parvi Spinus damage on the left, where you can see the distortion um, on the mandevilla. On right, this is broad mite damage. Um, on ivy and New Guinea and patients. And again, if you're unsure, this is where scouting and maybe cutting those tips and washing them, looking close with hand lens can help give you some information on what you're dealing with. So far, we've not seen Thrips parvi spinus on New Guineas um, and ivy, but, you know, things can change. So I think that looking at host plant lists a little bit can help too with diagnosing. Uh, your symptoms. One of the plant it absolutely loves is uh, Shuffleera, and it does definitely cause a lot of distortion on the plant to where the leaves are almost unrecognizable, um, and it can cause this like scarring on the underside of the leaf. I think one of the challenges of Florida is this is used a lot as hedging material, hotel parking lots, shopping parking lots, people's yards, and so here is a reservoir for them to be in. So as much as commercial growers are treating, you know, this, this can be an issue. Gardenia is another one that has, uh, can be very susceptible. As far as biocontrol options, I'm gonna tell you flat out right now, no, there's, not, no, there's no silver magic bullet. This is not, I don't have a perfect cure for this. Nobody does. But I think part of the things we need to be discussing are incorporating bio pesticides, nematodes, mites, and also possibly beneficial insects into programs. Because this thrips, there's not going to be one silver bullet. I know everybody wants one silver bullet, but this has got to be a multi-pronged approach to managing it. With biopesticides, in this particular situation, I'm basically talking about the Bavaria, the cordyceps, and the metarhiziums on the market. These are fungi. You guys are all familiar with them. We've been using it for thrips and white flies for years. Um, we do know these products under the right conditions can work very, very well on thrips. And I think that they're important 
to be incorporated because, and I've been saying this to everybody, we are just on a bullet train to resistance issues right now because the great pesticide work that has been done by Alexandra at UF and Sarah up in Canada with their trial work is great, but then people just say, okay, I'm just gonna spray these few pesticides that did well in the trial and spray them over and over and over again. We need to make sure we have products in there incorporated like these microbials, which we are not going to develop resistance to that can help prolong the use of these other synthetic chemistries that we do need to keep and have using in these programs. Um, so far, there hasn't been much trial work done with these, but from what I've seen in the field with some of my growers, I think that these can be a very important part of our programs, including soaps and oils. Um, you know, soaps and oils cannot always be used um, because temperatures environment, but I do have one grower, a tropical foliage grower, who said they've had very good success with Sufoil X in their program uh, with targeting the thrips on the foliage. So I think this is going to be an important part. Also nematodes. Um, so these thrips, depending on plant shape, structure, will drop to the soil to pupate, and nematodes have always been such an important part of managing western flower thrips and now onion thrips that I think these can be an important tool with controlling this particular thrips also. The question is, is which nematode, which rate, how we don't know yet. So honestly, as just like a shotgun effect, we are mixing a couple nematode species. We're applying them out. Sometimes we're tank mixing them with the microbials so that we can just have one more tool going after the different life stages in the soil. Um, and not have to worry about developing resistance. The reason why we're looking at mixing multiple species is because we don't know possibly which beneficial nematode would be most efficacious for this thrips. Also, there are some concerns over in the south with the warmer soil temperatures. Steinema feltiae is kind of a bit of a weenie when it comes to heat. And so it can tap out when soils get too warm. And that's why we're looking at nematodes like Carpocapsae, which can handle a bit warmer of soil temperatures. Predatory mites have a lot of potential here too, but, 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 um, there's actually, with this pest being in Europe for a while, uh, Juliet at BioBest has already been doing some biocontrol work on there, and she did find that Cucumeris and Swirskis will feed on the first instar of Parvis finest, but not at the same rate as it does in Western flower. So some of the management approach in Europe has been is to really jack up the number of Cucumeris out in vegetable production to try to um, just have more predatory mites to eat more first in star parvis finest. So we do think that down the road, I'm not telling people to jump into biocontrol for this because I don't think we're ready for it, but this may be an important part of the program for management here in North America because we do know they will feed on those first in stars. One of the challenges though, and again, this is work Juliet has been doing in Europe, and it's something um, I've also seen in tropical foliage is predatory mites can be very particular sometimes about textural differences on leaves. And they really like to have those hairs to lay their eggs in. And if you have completely smooth leaves like ficus and things that don't have the hairs, the predatory mites are not going to like it as much. And so the predatory mites tend to leave those plants and don't offer as much control as they would on something like a pepper or a plant that has domitia on the underside of the leaves. So this is why in biocontrol trials, things can be inconsistent because your leaf texture and hairs can make a difference on how your predators perform. As far as biocontrol options, and Steve's going to talk much more about this. Um, actually, I think that's Steve Thumb in my photo, because Steve and I um, had have been doing some tootling around um, dealing with this pest, and we did find in South Florida, Aureus coming in and naturally feeding on it. Is it enough to control it? No, not yet at this time, but I think this is going to be an important part of this whole management program down the road. Uh, lace wings can feed on it, but again, I think it's going to be very hard to get those applied out into large areas and to treat rove beetles in the soil for the pupa. I say limited juice, 
because a lot of growers in Southeast United States incorporate bifenthrin into their media because of the fire ant quarantine rules. So there could be limited use of that. But overall, we've got to use all these tools, you know, crop selection, maybe you shouldn't grow a plant that's so susceptible to parvispinus. We are seeing um, in mandevillas cultivar differences uh, which some are more attracted to and not, we're going to be have to do trapping, incorporate microbial pesticides, conventional pesticides, early detection. If you're bringing plant material in, you better be checking for it to make sure you're not bringing it in. Sanitation, nematodes, mites, insects, and who knows what else. But we've got to use all these tools. We can't just, oh my gosh, look, here's three pesticides that we know did well in the spray trial, spray, 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 because that is just going to create more resistance issues for us in the long run. And with that, I'm going to stop here and I'm going to hand it over to Steve. Um, so that he can continue on talking about biocontrol. Good afternoon, everybody. Let me share my screen with you all. Okay, can you, uh, can someone give me a thumbs up? You good? All right. Good, Stephen, looks good. All right, well, welcome everybody. Appreciate your uh, attendance. Thanks, Suzanne, that was very interesting. Uh, my name's Stephen Arthurs. I'm a technical sales specialist with BioB USA. And um, I'm gonna share some experiences today on Fritz Parvospinus. Um, quite preliminary because like I say, it's a relatively new pest. Uh, Suzanne covered a little bit of the background, but I'm down here in Florida and uh, it was first detected in Florida in 2020. Um, this is actually a, a couple of pictures um, from the location where it was first detected. It was detected on Hoya and Anthurium. And, I, and in this case, it, it does cause a fair amount of streaking. Um, deformation of buds and urinals, and then it will get into the, the young terminals, it will lodge in the young terminals and prevent, prevent the, the plants from developing. And uh, I actually visited this location the year after it was detected and the grower was having a lot of problems, he was throwing everything at it, didn't seem to be working. Um, and I actually spoke to him about a week ago and uh, just to kind of catch up on the situation and and he's found a, actually a very good solution. Uh, he's prevented this problem now. He, he just doesn't grow for your run theorem anymore. Um, so that's been one, one response. Um, but yeah, clearly it was a problem. Um, something, another interesting thing, uh, observation. In the early days, he didn't have problems in, in, in polytunnels. So these crops growing in polytunnels for whatever reason, the parvospinus were not um, getting in there. but as of this year, um, he, I guess he kept a, some plants in the polytunnels and they have jumped onto those. And he felt that maybe there was perhaps some kind of environmental adaptation going on. Um, that's uh, just purely anecdotal, of course, but I, I thought that was interesting. So anyway, that was my first experience. And then subsequent to that, um, it didn't seem to do a whole lot in 2021, but in 22, there was a rapid expansion uh, in its, in its location and also its host range. Suzanne touched upon that. Um, but really it started showing up in gardenia in commercial nurseries down in South Florida. It's not clear how it got there, but it rapidly became a problem. And initially people thought it might be chili thrips or something else, but after the detection, you know, growers soon got the word that it was this new type of pepper thrips. Um, and it caused a lot of problems. I visited a number of locations where it was really destroying the gardenia. Uh, a lot of pesticides were being used. Um, it also uh, turned up in residential landscapes. Um, and at least in one, one instance has turned up in commercial uh, pepper production as well. And at least one producer has been hit pretty hard. Um, so yeah, it's become a problem. Um, in 2023 was when I, I had more experience. 
Uh, it was mainly, again, gardenia. It started showing up with Schaeffler, and then became a problem really this season in Mandevilla, the Pudinia, uh, especially late season, um, which is an important winter growing crop in South Florida. And it was kind of new. And um, I'll talk a little bit more uh, about that. So basically, um, well, oh, I just want to give a, there's a couple of really nice websites. I just linked them below. Um, one, if you're interested in the, the host range and the history, um, uh, uh, Lance Osborne at, at the University of Florida has a, has a nice website. And also um, at the Tropical Research and Education Center, Dr. Alexandra Reventi. I'm not sure how you pronounce her name, but um, she's got some good information and also published the results of the insecticide bioassays that Suzanne referenced. So you can go there. Um, but basically, you know, just from my experiences going around, um, growers are spraying a lot of insecticides, often weekly or more. Um, the products that, uh, that were being used that I could tell, basically, although there's, um, I think, over 90 different products, products registered for thrips and ornamentals and close to 200 in vegetables, uh, a lot of those, of course, from the same active but there were basically 14 products from 12 IRAC groups that were being used. So theoretically a good basis for a rotation program. Um, and some of the more commonly products that, that were being used I've listed. Having said that, um, I gotta be honest with you, um, the, the results that would normally control many threat species of rotations don't seem to be having the same effect. And growers are definitely having some issues. And it has resulted in lost sales, it's resulted in some export restrictions. The, the state has a quarantine issue in place because it's still a regulated pest, which has uh, been somewhat controversial, but uh, it's here and, and it's an important, you know, it's um, something that the industry is having to deal with. And they're really starting now just to look at maybe using beneficials or I'll include biorationals in that as a possible alternative. And Suzanne made a really good point, which is that we know from experience um, that thrips can develop resistance. There was a happened to spinosid um, in several counties and there was a voluntary recall some years ago with Western flower thrips. So um, it is important to look at alternatives. So moving on, I, I was kind of interested, um, spent some time looking at plants and I just want to give some a couple of quick findings which I thought were interesting. This is in Mandevilla, an outdoor nursery. Um, and in this particular case, it in an application of Expire, which is one of the you know, more effective fritch products normally. Uh, it's a combination product. Um, the grower had also applied Bellifer, which is a contact. Um, and a sample uh, that I but when I when I looked at the plants and I counted, in this case, what we find with Mandevilla is the thrips, once you get flowers, they're very attracted to the flowers. They tend to attack, attack the flowers more than the, than the vegetative growth at this point, which is interesting. I'll, and that's an interesting point for beneficials I'll come back to. But basically, they had a relatively high population of uh, harvest spinous in the blooms. I would say 90% plus blooms were infested. Very few larvae. Um, in this case, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, oh, okay. So basically what I would, I assessed how many of the, the so in this case, we had adult male and female thrips and um, we only somewhere between 16 and 36% of the females were dead and higher for males, about 70% of the male thrips were dead. The impression that I'm getting, and this is sort of backed up by, by other uh, reports I'm hearing, um, the, 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 the females are hard to kill. The adult females are the hardest stage to kill. Um, in this particular case, we might have expected 80% plus mortality based on Alexandra's data, but we were only seeing much, much lower. So clearly there's issues of coverage um, in the field and we're really not killing a high proportion of the females. The males definitely seem to be easier to kill. The larvae are easier to kill. Oftentimes where you see sites where insecticides have been used, you see a very high female bias sex ratio of adult females. Um, unfortunately, uh, thrips can lay, uh, females can lay, um, can, can still lay eggs and produce, males are producing unfertilized eggs. So that unfortunately is not necessarily a control um, solution. 
Um, so following an application of conserve and a subsequent sample eight days later, similar results, slightly higher control in the baskets, maybe the coverage was slightly higher in the baskets. But again, I just want to point out that um, a lot of this is to do with coverage uh, and Mandevilla are hard to get good coverage because of the flowers um, in many different directions. But the same thing, this was another location. Um, I don't have the application dates, but this was Piston, Abamectin, and Conserve. Uh, Piston is Borfenopur, normally it's a strong touch material. Again, um, lower pressure here, um, but again, still two thirds of males dead, only a third of females dead. So I get the impression that insecticide control is going to be problematic uh, for several reasons. So there is an interest in biocontrol options, um, and there's a number of different things uh, potentially available that are used for thrift management programs and ornamentals and vegetable crops. There's uh, probably four species of predatory mites. This is for the above part plant, uh, above ground parts of the plant. There's three species of ambaceous um, mites, which do we know feed on thrips generally on the, the earlier stage, younger stages. And there's Amblymodromus lomonicus also is used for thrips control. They're commercially available. They all have their own characteristics and what the, the ones that will work best in a situation will depend on the environment and the type of plant and so forth. In South Florida, Swirsky is normally used most because of the, the environmental conditions, the price and the, the temperature down here. Um, Amongst the predatory insects that we know will feed on thrips under certain situations, the most obvious candidates would be lacewings. There's two species of lacewings available. The pirate bugs, which I'll come back to, um, and a predatory mirrored dicyphus. Uh, it's normally used for white fly control in tomatoes, but it will feed on thrips as well. And, and there's some interest in, in that one too. So this is where it gets interesting. So we know that the effective long-term sustainable thrips programs often that, that use biocontrols often have a component to target the soil stages to help break the life cycle. We see the parvospinus, when it gets going, it builds up high populations, it's much harder to control. If you can prevent that in, in crop reproduction, then it's a lot easier to control. So there's another species of mite, um, hypoaspis, many of you know it, know it as. And Delosia, which are the rove beetles, they've been used in ornamental propagation for a long time. They're well known to feed on uh, Western flower thrips, and they definitely can uh, be important in certain situations. And of course, Suzanne mentioned the nematodes, uh, and it's true that we ha have not, to my knowledge, screened the different nematodes, but Felsi is the, is the obvious one um, to use and based on its history of uh, infecting thrips. Um, some growers I work with were applying it via a drench, but that's very time consuming. So um, a few used it, applied them via overhead irrigation. There's a lot of pros and cons and caveats to using nematodes in that way. I won't get into right now, but if anyone's on the call, they want to share their experiences, um, please do. So there's a number of options available. So I'll run through just some uh, preliminary fields observations. This is in Gardenia about 20,000 square foot of liners. This, so the plants were quite young. There was a high population uh, of parvospinus. Um, what we did is we decided to put out with the corporation of the grower, a few different beneficials and kind of see what we could find. Um, so we basically, yeah, so there were upwards of 50 thrips uh, per, per terminal, uh, very high pressure. Um, and so we came in with a no, normally a curative rate of Swirsky, Aureus, which are the pirate bugs, um, and the, the, the stratiolalaps, the hypoaspis in the soil, see what would happen. Um, and I'm going to move this so I can read my screen. <laughs> um, uh, and basically, did, a week later, we did not see a decline in adult thrips. We saw a decline in larval thrips by about 60%, which was interesting. Still high damage to new growth, unfortunately. And the only beneficial we recovered in that case was we, we were able to recover stratiolaps in the soil, did not recover the other two. Um, there was an application of Hachi Hashi, unfortunately, that was made around about the time on some of the areas which may have caused a problem. So we came back in. Did the same thing again without the aureus, which didn't seem to want to hang around. Um, 
came back in again, assessed a week later. Again, there was no clear decline in adult FRIPS. It was approximately the same number as, as we'd seen uh, three weeks prior. Um, and there was no, tier, no clear decline in this case in larvae either. Again, high damage to new terminals. Very, um, we were unable to recover. Oh, we recovered Swirsky at very low numbers. Um, and again, we could recover Stradiol laps, but clearly in that situation with a coming in with a high pressure in this particular plant, this was not an effective strategy. We just wanted to get some observations. So I'll come back to why we think that is in a second. Um, now I want to talk a little bit about Mandevella. So this is this is an interesting one because prior to Parvospinus, the main problem in Mandevella was spider mites. And a number of growers have been getting good results controlling spider mites by routine releases of Phytoceus prosimilis. Um, I believe there's a little video. Um, you can see how they're being applied in some cases by hand or by blower. And some growers have been doing this for a few years now, and it seems to work relatively well. Um, so unfortunately, the, with the parvospinus coming in, it's really messed up that program, which is unfortunate. So we did some observations with Aureus, um, and this was based on the fact we were actually starting to see, and some growers reported it, Aureus showing up naturally in Mandevilla. This was by probably early, uh, uh, mid to late April, perhaps. Um, no, uh, March, I beg your pardon. This was in March, so still relatively late. All, all the varieties of Mandevilla had flowers. Aureus was showing up um, naturally. Uh, and there are native species of Aureus in South Florida. Um, so in this particular case, we released Aureus in six acres um, at, a, at a relatively low rate, um, considering at the time 90% uh, of the flowers were infested. Um, but the problem with Aureus is it tends to fly away. So in this case, the fact it's naturally associated with Mandevilla flowers was interesting. And after two days, we found Aureus in, depending on the block, two to three percent of the blooms, and we found it feeding on the parvospinus. Um, and when I did the calculations, uh, there were about 100,000 flowers an acre. So if we recovered Aureus from two to three percent of the blooms, that's two to th three thousand Aureus per acre, given we released 2,000 an acre. I have fairly high confidence that the vast majority of the aureus stayed in the blocks. They didn't fly away. They went to the flowers. They started feeding on thrips. So that's encouraging. Um, but because the population was so high, 2,000 an acre wasn't enough. Um, the, the grower had made a couple of applications, uh, uh, sprays. And a week later, most of the aureus were dead, um, presumably from insecticide poisoning. Um, which is unfortunate, but on a high note, four days later, I found aureus reproduction in the flowers, aureus nymphs. So that is encouraging. And uh, I want to come back to the aureus diapause issue in a minute. But important point, I do, uh, I do think that aureus in certain uh, flowering ornamentals provide pollen or nectar that it naturally associates with. Um, aureus could be an important tool. And the question is, how to use it? Um, here's just another quick video. So you can see um, aureus inside feeding on parvospinus um, very readily. Within, within a short time of release, they go to the flowers. They start feeding on the parvospinus. They can fly from flower to flower to flower. They're very dispersive, unlike the predatory mites. They're, it's hard to get good contact of insecticides in the flower. Systemics aren't going to be translocated well. So I was quite, this might be something to work on. In terms of having aureus, maintaining them, um, there's a lot of information out there on using pep, ornamental peppers as aureus plants. Um, the uh, Mexican sunflower is an interesting one. This seems to be, this is a type of aster, Tithonia species. This one, we've seen it naturally attract uh, native aureus in Florida throughout the winter. And uh, there's a native species of aureus pumilio. Um, some work by the University of Florida, uh, Sri Lanka, Lahiri, University of Florida Gulf Coast Research Station is, is looking at using um, banker plants in, in strawberries because actually strawberry growers are getting hammered right now by um, chili thrips. And given strawberry is a potential host of parvospinus, they could be in for another shock. So 
it's not there yet. But um, Alan kindly shared these photos with me. They're planting uh, this Mexican sunflower. It does get quite tall, but it's a wonderful, uh, seems to be a wonderful uh, uh, track, insectary plant for aureus. So I think that finding ways to keep aureus around nurseries could be very beneficial. Um, well, I think one short last video. This this is, this is um, something that some growers are now starting to experiment more with. This is drone application. Um, primarily, this is used for spider mite control. This is, I think you, hopefully you can see the video, it's not too jittery. So this is hibiscus. What's interesting, I've looked at hibiscus in areas where we have harvest finest. I've never seen it on there. Doesn't mean it won't get on there, it's a recognized host. But it occurs to me that when you have perhaps slightly less attractive uh, host plants for harvest finest, maybe you could use something like pepper as a, as a, as a track plant. Um, I don't know, it's, it's think about. Okay, so I don't know how long I'm talking for, but what did we learn? Some quick take home messages. Like I say, this is preliminary. Um, I think this point has been reiterated. Biological control, we need to look at it. It could have an important role. It needs to start early before spray thresholds are reached. It can be very difficult afterwards, either because you have to release too many and it'd be too expensive or they just won't work. So. Got to think ahead, got to have a game plan. Plant type's important. Suzanne alluded to this. The gardenia, uh, it has a, a smooth waxy leaf, didn't seem to be particularly suitable. Um, and so it may be that bio control has to work with certain varieties of plants. Um, uh, plants that have uh, flowers, pollen, nectar can be attractive. Many beneficials will feed on that, uh, may be more suitable. Rates. Um, from what I can tell and what I'm hearing, predatory mites may need to be released at higher rates than are normally used for thrips control. Uh, that's going to affect the bottom line, but it may need to be part of a preventative program. Um, Aureus insidiosus, I believe, has high potential in flowering ornamentals that produce nectar or pollen. Um, I, I really do. I think that's something to look at. A number of growers were releasing them, but again, it was late in the season. There were a lot of insecticide residues out there. We couldn't give it a fair bash. Uh, I believe releasing it earlier, maybe soon after flowering, when you have 5 to 10% of your flowers infested, you'll be able to get much better control at an economical rates. This is something we need to investigate. A couple of caveats. Um, aureus that are released, the F1 generation, that's the nymphs of the ones that are released, are probably going to be in reproductive diapause in South Florida, anywhere from mid-April, uh, anywhere from late September to mid-April because of the day length. So you are not going to get long-term establishment. You're going to have to be releasing possibly monthly during that period of time. So just some things to keep in mind. And it's clear insecticides need to be managed carefully to integrate the biocontrols. And that's a whole area. Here, I've just got some examples um, of the kind of insecticide side effects that, that are reported by IOBC, amongst other sources. These should be used as a guide. Um, but basically, here's the bottom line. So a lot of the older materials that are still being used, and that might even include chlorpyrifos, I've still seen that being used, they, they're not compatible with your beneficials. If, if you have to a certain point make a decision, um, basically red is bad and green is good and there's intermediate levels. And these are simplified side effect tests. They don't take into account a lot of issues like sublethal effects. Um, which are going to be important, but in general, the higher you the higher you go up on the IRAC group, the more selective your materials will be. So this is something to talk about. Talk to Suzanne. Talk to your beneficial supplier. Talk to your your um, you know your your extension people. And if you are wanting to incorporate bio biocontrols, you've got to have a game plan. Okay. Um, I'm. How am I doing for time? I've got two slides left. I think. Yeah, just keep going. We're good. Okay. All right. Good. Okay. So I just really want to mention quickly pepper because I think it's exciting. Um, but this is often called pepper thrips. Um, and this is where I think we have some good news potentially. Um, we know parvospinus loves pepper. It seems to be quite closely associated with it. It can cause a lot of damage. Uh, these are pictures from a commercial location in Broward County, I think probably from this year taken by, by Anna 
Mesosos, Mesoros, I don't know how you pronounce your name. Um, but there's reports in the literature of fixed parvospinus recently causing damage, up to 100% damage in chili crops. So again, this is a, a big issue, but we know that biological control have been used successfully to control thrips and peeps in sweet pepper greenhouses worldwide for many, many years. Um, there's a lot of research backing it up. There's a lot of grower uh, uh, experiences. Um, the question is, how does parvospinus fit into that picture? And that's a little unclear, but personally, I think that we can probably do it. Um, I saw some research recently from the Netherlands uh, where they, they, they reported that repeated introductions of three beneficial stradiolalaps, which is the soil mite, cucumerous on, on, uh, attacking the young larvae, um, and lacewings were effective uh, under commercial situations. Um, I referenced that's uh, Pinnacar et al. Um, so that was interesting. Um, there definitely is some potential there. Uh, and then what kills a uh, biocontrol prior to parvospinus and pepper in Florida was the pepper weevil, which uh, necessitates a lot of insecticides. And even the organic guys are spraying a lot of pyganic. Um, but there is now uh, a biocontrol option for pepper weevil. It's a Catalaxis hunteri. It's a teramalid parasitoid. Um, that's starting to be used in Mexico for pepper weevil control. So we may have more options to come up with the integrated control in pepper. Personally, I think that has to be the, the, the future direction uh, to incorporate parvospinus as well. I think there's a lot of promising research there. So that's exciting. Um, and oh, I just borrowed one slide from BioBeat R&D. Then this is showing how the beginning of pepper, how biocontrols are incorporated into pepper at a very early stage by inoculating the plants with predatory mites and supplemental feed before they get planted out in the field. Um, and this works well also for aureus releases and it's become very well adapted there as an early release strategy. So I just wanted, I just borrowed that slide from the R&D. Um, and I think, so just to quickly summarize, from what I can tell the current insecticide rotations uh, that I saw they're not working well. Eradication may be impractical in many cases, and as Suzanne mentioned, there's a risk of resistance. So ultimately, I think the sustainable approach may be looking towards softer programs where you're going to have to start using biorationals and beneficials and possibly clean up sprays prior to shipping. We're clearly some way from being there, but I think that probably will be what will, will ultimately will be the goal. So obviously, growers have to have a game plan, try to maintain proper spinous levels from the start inspecting plants, considering dipping, which Sarah's done some great work on, monitoring, possibly trap crops, sanitation where needed. All these approaches will have to be in place. Um, but with the biocontrols, I know I didn't have much, but hopefully what I had was of interest, but certainly watch this space because we're very interested. Um, and that's it for me. Sorry if I went over time, but um, thank you for your attention. Yeah, we're doing pretty good on time, uh, a little bit five minutes over. So uh, I'm gonna share my screen next. If uh, Stephen, you wanna stop sharing that. So far, I've been riveted by all the stuff I've been learning from you guys. So I hope everyone in the audience is too. All right, just bring my presentation up. Do, do, do. Uh, I'm not sure this is sharing what I wanted to. It's thinking. Hold on. <laughs> we can see. There we go. That, that looks better. Okay. I think it was just thinking on my end. <laughs> Always scares me a little bit with these government computers. All right. Um, I'm going to try to keep us on time. Uh, so this is results of an on-farm trial. I've been working with a particular grower up here in Ontario for about eight months. Um, and we walked through a lot of things and then sort of figured out after what worked and what didn't. Um, so we're going to go through some of this. So just for some background, we're talking about a greenhouse crop of Mandevilla. So different colors, different sizes. These cuttings were from Guatemala. They come in um, around June or July. They get potted up in July or August for sale the next May. So it's a bit of a long-term crop for us up here. 
Um, they were growing around 120,000 pots total. And I think the big difference between what's happening up here, you know, in the northern part of the country in greenhouses versus what's happening in Florida is first of all, we're growing inside. Second of all, we usually have one crop cycle, um, just trying to hit that summer patio season. And our crops aren't getting reinfested from Parvus finus outside because it can't overwinter here and we don't have the right hosts in the landscape. So it's literally just what's coming in on your cuttings and then that exploding in your greenhouse. Just for an idea for growing temperatures, because these are potted up around uh, August, September, uh, or a little bit earlier than that, and then they're held over the winter at around 15 to 18 Celsius, um, which I can't remember what that is, 66-ish, um, to whether they keep putting on some vegetative growth, but it's not a ton of growth. And then as soon as warmer temperatures hit in March, they sort of go crazy, they start trellising, and then flowering doesn't happen until closer to sale in May. Um, so the problem this particular greenhouse had, um, their problem started in 2021. They started noticing damage like this, some of the, like the picture Suzanne has gone over. Of course, they originally suspected broad mite, but then they had the thrips identified as thrips carpus finus. And what they did was they attempted uh, a normal uh, thrips management program with biocontrol. So we're talking about a ton of cucumeris, which also works, can work for broad mite, and Bovary applications. Unfortunately, they didn't really see good results from this. So they eventually attempted pesticides, but this was probably done too late when populations were really, really high. So in their minds, pesticides didn't work at all and they lost 60% of the crop. So this September, they started noticing the damage again. Um, so they knew they needed to attack things differently because of what happened last year. So they sort of brought a whole team of people in. This is really a hands-on deck approach. Um, and I'll, I'll show you where we went. So this was definitely a throw in the spaghetti at the wall situation to see what sticks. Um, we did try biocontrol first because of rumors that thrips primus finus is the most insecticide thrip, most insecticide resistant thrips in the world, even more than Western flower thrips. I think some of this, these rumors came out of um, Europe. We added in mechanical controls. We finished with chemical controls. So basically we did all the things um, and before anyone asked, no, I didn't have any control treatments because this is a non-farm trial and apparently growers don't love it when you suggest part of their farm be untreated. Um, so it is kind of messy and not necessarily how I would have designed things to get clear cut results, but um, we did get some really good results in the end. And uh, ultimately the decisions had to be made by the grower and the owner, you know, to conserve their crop and um, their business. So a little bit messy, but we, we got through it. Um, so we're going to start with non-pesticide controls. So uh, this was in a nine inch crop of reds and whites varieties, red and whites. Um, the reds were sort of the epicenter of where the thrips parvus finus uh, came from in this facility. We released large bios as per what Stephen just said that a lot of these larger bios seem to work better than mites, but mites might play a supporting role based on um, Juliet's data from Europe. And temperature was also a consideration with what we chose because we were going into this in September, October when light levels and temperature levels were already low. Um, we had to pick bios that do well in a cooler environment. So we ended up picking cucumerous and putting in one sachet per pot. We also released this new predatory mite. Um, it's a really large mite, so I consider this a large bio. Um, it's like almost like a little baby spider. And as says, this is only currently available in Canada, as well as Dicyphus, um, a predatory bug that Stephen mentioned. We did feltii, nematodes in the soil, and green lace wings released as eggs. And we assessed these for one month. So because biocontrol tends not to be curative, it works very much preventatively successfully, uh, we knew we were going to have to add more tactics in. So because the red variety seemed to be the source of the thrips infestation, we thought, okay, uh, is, and like most of the damage was happening in the growing tips, we thought, is this where the population is? And what happens if we remove this part of the plant? The mandevilla, like the lower leaves looked pretty healthy otherwise, the roots looked great. So we thought maybe these plants could handle like a big whack prune and still recover if we could get rid of a lot of the thrips. 
So we also took a subset of these plants when the grower did the hacking back and we washed um, the tops of the plants and the bottom of the plants to get all the thrips off to actually determine where the thrips were residing. Lastly, um, in our non-chemical controls, we added in mass trapping. Uh, after the plants were cut back, we put in one small monitoring card in every other plant of the reds. And you can see this was almost 2,200 cards, which is amazing. This was the grower's idea, it was brilliant. Um, the numbers of thrips on the cards were counted after three weeks and we used yellow cards. And for assessing outcomes, we did plant taps. This is really the gold standard for this pest. If you wanna know more about plant taps and why they're important and how they compare to monitoring with cards, check out my monitoring talk on the Horticultural Research Institute uh, webinar that was on May 10th. I think I already put the link in the chat. Okay, so what happened in the month when we did all this? Um, you can see from these graphs, November 4th was where we started. Uh, BIOS had been released just before this, but they wouldn't have had a chance to work by November 4th. So you consider this our like pre-treatment level. And you can see that the average number of thrips per pot was around 37 thrips per pot in the red and around uh, just under 20 in the whites. And you can see that by December 2nd, we had reduced uh, both of these to around 10 thrips per pot. Um, so that's pretty impressive. Um, note that the red got the pruning, the mass trapping and the biocontrol where the whites just got pruning and biocontrol. But because we did all the things, again, the spaghetti on the wall approach, um, it's hard to know which strategy contributed what. So I'm gonna do a little bit of some uh, envelope math, math on the back of an envelope kind of situation to see if we can figure out what's what. So remember I talked about doing those washes of the prunings when, to see where the thrips reside on the top versus the bottom of the plant. Um, this is the graph here, percent distribution with adults and larvae. And you can see that for both adults and larvae, more were found on the top of the plant. So 60% of the population for both was at the top of the plant. And this is for both adults and larvae. So what that means is essentially when we did that big prune um, in the middle of November, we were reducing the population by 60%. Um, so I put in, we didn't actually monitor on this day, the 18th, but I put in little bars of where the population should have been based on that. Um, so the caveat to this is, Obviously, you need to bag up those pruned ends right away so you're not just reinfesting your crop. You don't want to be putting this on a cart, dragging it through a greenhouse and putting it in your cull pile where they can just fly back in. Like it's got to be bagging up as you go. Also, the other caveat of this is it likely reduced the biocontrol agents because they were probably on the top of the foliage as well. But still an impressive result. So what about mass trapping? Um, You'll remember from the previous slide that we did get better control in the reds, and this was the treatment that had mass trapping in it. So we had collected the cards and we counted thrips on them. You can see the dots here in pink represent the females and the green dots represent males. And we figured out that there was an average of 45 thrips caught per pot per card over 20 days. So this averaged out to 2.2 thrips per day per pot, which is pretty amazing and 80% of those caught on the cards were female. So we can math this out and assume that mass trapping reduced the population by another 17%. So obviously that was a very handy tool as well. Okay, so what about our biocontrol agents? Um, determining their role depends on a couple of things. Can we recover them uh, like Stephen did with his stuff? How many are there, the density, when we try to find them again? And are they reproducing? Because that's a sign of whether they're establishing in the crop. So when we did this with our bios, unfortunately, we could only cover anistis and cucumerus. We obviously didn't look at the felti eye nematodes in the soil. But the other two big bios, we just couldn't find again. Um, anistis was reproducing. We saw 70% of the anistis were nymphs on December 2nd, which is great. Um, I would say that uh, the number of cucumerus we found was pretty low overall, lower than, just a little bit higher than the anistis. But when you consider the release rates, we were only releasing one anistis per meter squared in the whites and five in the reds. And each pot had a cucumerus sachet, you know, where hundreds are supposed to be coming out a week. So I think that comes back to what Suzanne was saying about the leaf texture. I'm not sure the cucumerus were thrilled about it. It could have also been in winter um, conditions that affected it. 
there are some results from uh, a colleague of mine, Rose LeBay up here in Canada, who's shown that cucumers actually does have travel establishing on plants in the winter. So that could have been part of it. So if you look at just the whites where we didn't have the confounding factor of mass trapping, we just had pruning and then biocontrol, you can see that after the big prune where we reduced things by 60%, biocontrol for the next two weeks was able to hold the population steady. So in this situation, I consider that a win. Uh, why? Because um, obviously biocontrol would have been a lot more effective had we started earlier. This was also looking at biocontrol over a very short time frame, like just a month. Um, so I think the fact that we got just held the population steady in a thrips that is, has pretty crazy development um, is a success. I agree with Suzanne and Stephen that we're likely going to need multiple natural enemies, especially those that can prey on the adults. So that's where the bigger ones come in. And I think it's also going to be need to be paired with other interventions, as shown here, like mass trapping, pruning, and removing flowers, if that's possible. It is possible in this crop, um, especially over the winter when the plants aren't excited about flowering as much, because that really means that the mass trapping is that much more attractive because there's nothing else but like green things for them to be attracted to. I will say that we ended up spraying as we got down to uh, and held at this 10 thrips per plant, but that was still causing damage. That ended up being our damage threshold. So we went in and sprayed. So with that, I'll go on and talk about the chemical controls we did. You might've seen this slide presented by Christy Palmer on the webinar on the 10th. I wanna really just attract your attention here to this right-hand column. This is the products available for thrips in Canada versus the middle column is the products available that most of you have in the US. So you can see we have a lot fewer products. Um, some of these have even been phased out. So we're doing this with one hand tied behind our backs, which I think means the results that we got are even more impressive. So while we were doing biocontrol in the nine inch, we were running a simultaneous trial in the six inch, just doing pesticides. So I just have to say off the bat that rates and products were basically just guesses. None of Alexandra's data um, from Florida had come out yet. Um, we were making guesses based on our experience with Western flower thrips in Ontario. So we picked uh, spinosad, which is success or conserve, depending on what country you're in, and flunicamid, um, belief or aria. And we chose these because we wanted to be able to reintroduce aureus in the spring. Um, so we know these would be softer on that. And we were also worried about phytotoxicity with Mandevilla. Um, so, you know, your big three, Avid, Contos, Pylon, which is piston in the States, can definitely cause potential phyto effects. So because we just didn't know, we thought this was the best strategy. And we did pick uh, two pesticides with two mode of actions to mix together which can provide superior control, um, but doing it this way can also promote resistance. So it was a bit of a double-edged sword, but we wanted to throw flunicamid in there because it's a, a feeding cessation product, which means we could lower the damage even if it wasn't necessarily killing a huge amount of the thrips. So what happened? Um, these are our six inch pots. Uh, these are, um, average number of thrips per five plants because the plants were much smaller. If you do thrips per plant, you're getting into like 0.1 of a thrips or whatever, which gets confusing. So we pooled together data from five plants. So pre-spray, we had around 12 thrips per five plants. And then we put on our first and second sprench applications of uh, success and belief um, a week apart. And we did a sprench application, and this is because both of these products have contact um, and systemic properties. Success, for example, is registered for greenhouse um, veg uh, transplants, um, and it's systemic for those. So we wanted the product to translocate into the growing tips that needed the most protection as the plant grew. Um, but unfortunately, doing this sprench means we're using a big volume of chemicals and is obviously expensive. But we were, again, just spaghetti at the wall, trying, trying what we could. But as you can see, right after we did the pesticide applications, uh, the thrips numbers went down to almost zero. And we got eight weeks of control at this, which is fantastic. This is what the plants looked like before with really damaged tips. And things got a lot better. 
Um, so after this eight weeks of really good control, we had to spray again because we reached our damage th threshold of 10 thrips per five plants. So again, because we knew this worked and we were too nervous about the other pesticides causing phyto, we decided to go back in with what we know is successful. So we did a third and fourth application of spinosad and flunicamid. Um, and this did eventually bring it back down quite a bit, but I think we got some resistance developing. So that's our big red flag there that Suzanne and uh, Stephen talked about. So basically the third and fourth applications, things didn't go down as far and they didn't go down as fast. Um, also there's a fifth application because I guess we just kept going um, that I didn't show you where basically nothing happened. So we definitely hit resistance at that point. So just you know, to be super transparent about this, mistakes we made, we didn't rotate two active ingredients. We didn't rotate active ingredients after two applications, which is sort of the standard method to avoid resistance. We used the high US rate of spinosad. And honestly, the way to create resistant insects is to blast them with super high rates and then take the survivors and blast those again with super high rates. So that's essentially what we did. Um, because the sprench, even though the active ingredient for um, mills uh, would be the same as the label rate, because we put it on at a high volume, the plants are actually getting a lot more active ingredient. Um, so we exceeded the recommended AI per hectare. So we know we put on a ton of product. And honestly, the sprench may not have been the best use of coverage um, at this point in the crop. When the plants were itty bitty, it seemed to make sense. When they got bigger, I think we could have gotten away with a spray and gotten good coverage um, at that stage. But overall, the outcomes were good. Um, we had to do a final crop cleanup with pylon, which is piston, and uh, we threw another success conserve in there because um, it had been a few months since we'd put it on and that seemed to work. Uh, no phyto issues on any variety and we were able to sell every plant. So here's where we started and then you can see where we finished on the right and they all looked great. I'm just gonna go back to those nine inch plants. You will remember that I said that after we tried the biological and mechanical control, we had to spray um, in late December. So you can see our damage threshold for these nine inch plants is 10 thrips per plant because they're bigger, they can handle a few more thrips. Uh, when we put that success conserve uh, slash belief aria sprench on in late December, we were able to actually get 11 weeks of control in the reds and 16 weeks control in the whites, which is amazing, just from that one sprench. And we didn't do two applications there. So we've, we're starting to learn our lesson about maybe not blasting these <laughs> into outer space. Um, with the reds, you can see the white stayed low after that one application. So that's really all they got for quite a bit. And that's some of the variety effects that come into play. I don't know if anyone mentioned that before, but um, variety is huge with these guys. They really seem to be attracted to some more than others and cause damage on some more than others. And some plants seem to be able to grow out of it and some don't. So um, in terms of resistance management, it was good to leave those white ones alone because any thrips left on there will become more susceptible over time because they're not keeping getting blasted with different chemicals. Whereas in the reds, we had to keep going because um, the numbers started climbing again. So for our next session of uh, pesticide applications, we decided to go with really soft antifeedants alone. So this was ferrets or mainspring, still mixed with belief or aria. Started off as a sprench and then we moved to sprays because of cost reasons. And both of these are antifeedants. Um, and uh, Alexandra's data with 48 hour tests uh, didn't show a lot of um, efficacy with these products in terms of mortality, but they were just 48 hour tests. But she did show that they really decreased feeding and decreased feeding and damage should eventually lead to them dying over time. So I would say what we ended up doing was suppressing the thrips population with these products. The reason we chose them is because we wanted to reintroduce biocontrol again now that the weather was warming up and hopefully go the biocontrol route until the plants started flowering or we weren't pulling off flowers anymore. Um, so I think we got some control with this, but not as much as we were hoping. And by the time we released the biocontrol agents, we had already hit that damage threshold and we let it ride for another like week and a half to see if things would start to go down. They did start going down, but at this point, 
the grower started to get nervous and we decided to do uh, interventions with um, pylon, which is piston, uh, two applications of spray, and then lastly, an avid um, when the plant started flowering for cleanup. So I think part of the reason we did the, the pylon and avid is because the plants were starting to flower. And as Stephen mentioned, uh, at that point, the Parvus finus like to move up to the top of the plant into the flowers. It's much harder to get control there. You're probably not going to get control with systemics because systemics don't translocate into the petal tissue. So it's really about contact insecticides and probably something harsher is going to be your better bet there. So um, that was mostly for cleanup for sale so we could sell some clean plants. But maybe we would have gotten somewhere with biocontrol and delayed these a little bit more if we'd let it run a little longer. Uh, so just pictures again, I like to show success of where we started with just like all the nubbins being eaten off um, to slowly getting to these beautiful mandevilla. I took the photos before the, the flowers um, grew, but um, they sold every plant. And remember they lost 60% of the crop last year. So that's a big win. The last chemical control thing I'm gonna show you is eight inch baskets. Uh, these were a different white variety than I showed you before. They didn't seem that attractive, but after we sort of cleaned things up in the reds, I think those like leftover thrips discovered this white variety and they got hit hard um, in like late February, early March. We had 45 thrips per basket and you could see that they couldn't even trellis because every time a growing point would try to go up, they just get hammered. So we honestly thought these were gonna be garbage. So we decided to use these as our phyto test plants. Um, I, like I said, I was worried about contest, worried about Avid, worried about Pylon. So we just like, boom, 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 <laughs> put on whatever we could on these, like, let's see if we can induce phytotoxicity basically, because these are just going in the garbage. Um, but we were actually able to save every plant. And I think that's because even though we were spraying them weekly, we were rotating things effectively and we kept the thrips near zero so that plants were able to recover really quickly. Like this all, this whole new flesh came on in such a fast amount of time, it was impressive. And the chemicals we used here was we started off with a Contos French, then we moved to a single pylon, then a success or conserve, um, again with belief in Aria mixed in there. Then we did three pylons in a row because we had heard that sort of like two sprays was the magical number with pylon or piston and Mandevilla before leaves start falling off, which would not have been good. Um, but we did three in a row and nothing happened. Um, and then we did some avids to test that as well. And again, every one of those got sold. So overall for our chemical controls, all our programs worked. Again, these weren't programs in the sense of like, I designed them ideally. It was just like, we ended up doing three different things. So program one, this was in the six inch pots over seven months. We used one product basically with a really long residual. So this was our success conserve belief aria. We did five applications and then we switched to piston pylon to clean up. And then we tried success once more, which may or may not have worked at that point. But that did work. And I think it's because possibly we were doing it over winter and because we got such long residuals, maybe because of temperatures and maybe the thrips reproduction was slowing down a bit. That worked in our advantage. Program two was doing a better job rotating products, those with both long and short residuals. So we started with the long residuals to buy ourselves as much time as possible or long activity, I should say. And then um, came in with the shorter uh, activity products um, for cleanup. Um, and those were foliar applications of contact insecticides to try and hit those flowers. And then in the baskets, it was sort of doing products with a, a short window of activity over and over and over. And that still worked as well. But that, I think this only worked because we were so close to sale. We were on the weekly spray train with that, which is not sustainable over the long term. But because we were near sale and we just needed to rescue them, that did work. All right. So quickly, what is our plan for next year? So the whole time we were going through this, I was really thinking, this is like a Bemisia white flag control program in Poinsettia. We all know Bemisia white fly can also be super resistant, both the B type and the Q type. Um, we also get cuttings from offshore in Canada that have been sprayed with a ton of products. Um, the white fly already come in resistant. So our goal up here in Canada is to use a biocontrol based IPM program where basically 
our two, we have two strategies. So we're trying to reduce the incoming pest population as much as possible by doing cutting dips. Um, so washing the cuttings and reduce risk products basically to get all the pests off that you can get off. And then uh, early and high biocontrol use and propagation. And then the next step is to delay pesticides as long as possible as part of resistance management. Again, because the more generations the insects can go through, having not been exposed to pesticides, they'll revert back to a more susceptible population because being insecticide resistant actually has a fitness cost to them. So just quickly for, for talking about dips, if you don't know anything about dips or how to do it, um, there's lots of videos online that Rose has put together and her team. So just, just Google that. Um, but I was able to convince Rose from the Vineland and Research Innovation Center to do quick dips for tropical thrips. And similar to our results with Western flower thrips we've gotten before, we've shown that the most effective products um, are Botanigard and mineral oils such as landscape oil and stuff oil X. Though you might have a slightly better uh, experience with stuff oil X as it's less phytotoxic in general, we're doing tests on the same farm right now as we speak, where we're doing some in Botanigard, some in stuff oil, and um, just checking for phyto. Um, so our other plan for this year is obviously to use a bunch of biocontrols starting in propagation. So in propagation, the plants are intense and it gets kind of kind of hot. I mean, Canadian hot, not Florida hot. Um, but we need heat tolerant bios, so we're going to release a Nistis, which can go up to around 30. Swirsky eye because it's more heat tolerant than cucumerus. S. carpocapsi, which is more heat tolerant than feltii for nematodes. And we're going to use Bavaria applications weekly as well as the nematode applications weekly up to 30 degrees Celsius or 85 Fahrenheit. And then after that, um, that will kill the spores at temperatures past that. So then we're going to back off of that. And then once everything's potted up and we're more into production, which will be in the late summer, early fall and going into winter, we're gonna keep going with the Swirsky eye sachets, mostly because we think they could be the better predator for uh, Parvus binus. We're gonna continue with the lace wings again. Hopefully if we give them more time and we'll release them weekly, they'll establish, they're also cheap. Uh, we're gonna probably switch to S. Feltii nematodes and keep doing Bavaria again weekly, um, but not past uh, 22 Celsius or 72 Fahrenheit. Because again, that Bavaria has that sort of like low temperature threshold as well, where it's just like, not doing as much as you need it to. Um, in separate areas away from the Bavaria, we're going to be uh, testing aureus bankers. Um, so we're gonna be doing Garbinia, which is landscape Gerbera and Alyssum, and adding pollen uh, to some and not others, and Artemia to some and not others, to see if that helps. So far, we're getting some really exciting results with this where we are getting aureus to reproduce on the Garbinia and Alyssum planted together. Um, and interestingly, the parvus finus seem to be really attracted to the alyssum, but they're not reproducing on it. So it's possible that could act as a trap plant as well. We've tried ornamental peppers and we've tried chili peppers as trap plants in vegetative mandevilla, and that did not work at all, unfortunately. So mandevilla still seems to be the most attractive thing, but alyssum is giving me hope. So uh, we're still going to make use of physical controls, so pruning, removing flowers, mass trapping, using yellow in the summer months and blue in the winter. This is based off of preliminary data. I'll share more of that later. And I know people are always concerned about using mass trapping because they think, oh, they catch my bios. But um, we've done a lot of studies up here in Canada about that, and they really don't take many out of the system. So considering how effective mass trapping is for Parvus finus, it's a very flighty thrips. Like you just look at it and they want to get off the plant. They're so active. I think mass trapping is just um, uh, like has to be the standard practice with these guys. Um, so just back to our example of white fly biocontrol or uh, bio-based IBM and poinsettia. We also do delayed pesticide applications like I mentioned, but this is based on not just that it's September. That's why we, we try to wait until after bract formation. Um, so biocontrol has the longest possible chance to work before we spray, but we don't just say, oh, it's the end of September and we spray. This is 100% based on scouting thresholds. If the plants are clean, we just let biocontrol run its course. So this is kind of how I envision or am hopeful about our Mandevilla IPM program is again, cuttings that receipt, then initiate uh, biocontrol and mass trapping 
uh, under the tents and um, continuing that at potting. And then I'm hoping we can get to the end of December or maybe January before we need to spray any pesticides. And at that point, um, I would want to do just the varieties that are needed instead of the whole farm, again, as a, a form of resistance management of maintaining a susceptible population somewhere on the farm. Um, and then choosing softer chemicals first or ones with really short residuals so that we have a chance of reintroducing bios in March when the temperature and light levels are more favorable for that. And then for cleanup, I think it's gonna be a reality that we'll have to use harsher pesticides there to make sure that there's not thrips running around in flowers. And then rotate, 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 two applications max before um, you need to rotate and use the lowest rate first. I think that was our biggest mistake with the success conserve is going in at that high rate we knew worked for Western flower thrips. I don't think we needed to do that, um, especially considering Alexandra's data showed that the normal US label rate worked just fine. So we're going to control ourselves this year, I think. And with that, I just wanna thank everyone involved. Um, so many people were part of this, including um, Nadia and Avery who have helped me do like a ton of scouting and a ton of thrips counting on cards. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and Kara is gonna come on and we're gonna do our question and answer period for those of you who are still here with us. Um, hopefully we're a little over time, but I think we'll give ourselves uh, 10 or 15 minutes for questions. Suzanne and uh, Stephen, if you want to pop back on. All right, well, thanks so much. That was some very informative presentations. I feel like I learned a lot about Trips Harvest Finest myself. Um, so we do have quite a few questions and there's a couple um, that are overlapping. So I'm gonna try and group them together. Um, just for the sake of time. So there's some interest in how to distinguish um, different species from Thrips parvus finus. So two in particular were asked about by multiple people, Frank Liniella intonsa and Frank Liniella fusca. So can you comment on um, how, how their appearance differs? Yeah, so fusca I could answer to, not intonsa because we don't have that up here, uh, but uh, Fusca's in our key, and um, it's we've separated our key into light and dark thrips, and I think like in Tons is one of the first things that comes out, so that can definitely be seen with just a dissecting scope. Um, I'm blanking on the features on the top of my head, <laughs> but they are quite different. And Tons, or sorry, um, Fusca also is one of the ones that can have a wingless form, so if you see a dark thrips without wings, it's probably Fusca. <laughs> Also, the one person was asking about being able to do it in the field, which I think unless you've got mm -hmm. super duper crazy, you know, 15 year old eyeballs, you're not going to be able to do it. Um, but I did answer in one of the chats thing because there's um, counting antennal segments. If you can see that because there are antennal segments differences there, um, because that's kind of one of the go to things I kind of start looking at now is antennal segments, especially with onion thrips and Western flower thrips as an easy cheater shortcut thing to do but i think that um you know counting those internal segments but again with a 10x hand lens i just my eyes can't do that i think behavior is a big part of it too like parvus finus is so fast they run around like crazy like the first time i saw them uh this farm actually also had uh, a lot of columbula or springtails which like bounce around on their butts um and they were as fast and as like springy as the columbula so i would say if you've got you know, uh, thrips that's light on, like tan on the top half and dark on the bottom half and is bopping around like nothing you've ever seen before, then it's probably part of spines. They didn't seem that that bouncy in Florida. Maybe it was too hot oh. to down there. Or maybe they just like Canada better and they're like, this is not about <laughs> oh, <man>. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I've never seen that two-tone look with, with Fusca. Um, in tons I'm not so familiar with, but I don't believe it has the same distinctive two-tone coloration. Um, the other thing is the male, the the male dimorphism with um, with parvus pinus, I think, is not seen with either of those other species where you get the males that are very clearly uh, dimorphic. Um, but beyond that, um, yeah. okay. thanks. Um, okay, another question. Do the predatory mites 
work well on plants with whitish bloom and or stomatal pits. Wow, that's a good question. Stomata, what was the first one? Uh, do predatory mites work well on plants with whitish bloom and or stomatal pits? I don't, I don't think the bloom color should matter, but um, I don't know about stomatal pits. I feel like we're the anytime you get the three of us silent, you've asked a stumper <laughs> of a question. So well done, well done, sir. Yeah, I mean, predatory <laughs> mites are, are pretty much blind, so they're they're not. I don't know that they respond to color so much. Um, the stomata pits is a new one for me. Um, I don't know if they respond to those. Suzanne, do you know? No idea. I'm I'm digging through my horticultural physiology <laughs> course from right. 30 years ago and trying to be like stomatal pits, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I think leaf hairs and pollen and uh, are the two and uh, domitia and things like that are the features that we know do make a difference. And well, I want to know what plants have yeah. still model pits. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you've given us yeah, some e homework. Email us all later and tell yeah. us what you're yeah. talking yeah. about. Yeah. We need a plant physiologist on here. <laughs> Zalia um, supposed to have Okay. Uh, do we know what temperature they won't survive at? So I'm guessing their lower threshold uh, for thrips harvest finest. And oh, I don't. Yeah, so we did a little bit of work, on, or I should, shouldn't say we, I'm using the royal we of Canada. Um, so Ashley Summerfield from the Vineland Research and Innovation Center, along with the dipping, we also looked into chilling the, the cuttings as they come in, like the growing points. And it, it had to be below five. It was sort of somewhere between three and five was what killed 70% of them. Um, and talking to different growers, they said that might work, but it's going to be very variety dependent on what the cuttings can tolerate in terms of cold. So that is something we want to explore more. Like, could we chill the cuttings first and then dip them? You know, something, something. It could be a possibility. Um, on the high end, again, I feel like this is just thrown off from by Florida, but I'm just going to speak Canadian wise. Uh, the grower that I was working with last year. Um, the year before when they were trying biocontrol and then pesticides didn't work and things got out of control, one way they were able to save that 40% of their crop was actually by heating their greenhouse to 40 Celsius for six hours continuously. And then they did that for several days in a row. Um, and that seemed to like bake like enough of the Parvus minus without hurting the Mandevilla. But again, I feel like everyone in Florida is just rolling their eyes at me right now because 40C doesn't sound very high. So I don't know if it's because they were already like more adapted to cooler temperatures, having been in that greenhouse like all winter. Interesting. Um, and there were a couple of questions actually about one was, can you freeze them out, um, stop That's them right. from overwintering? Okay. And the other was, can you uh, overheat them? <laughs> Yep, so I would say it's possible, but it's going to be like what the crop can tolerate and what your greenhouse structure can tolerate. Because obviously heating, you have to be very careful with that because you could affect like the wiring or like the plastic tubing or yada, yada, yada. So it's just something you have to be very careful with. And I've seen people do heat treatments with crops and I watched a friend of mine kill a entire crop trying to heat treat aphids out um, because he was told his temperature, you know, he could try this. So uh, it's it's really risky with plant material in there. And even if there's no plant material, getting the temperature hot or cold in every nook and cranny too, because, mm -hmm. you know, the floors tend to, you know, hold heat and, you know, it's it can help suppress, but it's not gonna be a, an eradication tool. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think what helped this grower was they were switching crops afterwards too. So, it, you know, that helped get rid of the population. And uh, also the other warning I would have would be phytotoxicity. Like if you put something like pylon on and then jack up the temperatures, like that's probably a recipe for phytotoxicity. So most of the most of the temperature work's been done post harvest. The only example I can think of I came across recently with this question wasn't with harvest finest, it was with cannabis aphids. And one of the sanitation programs was to heat up the rooms to 120 degrees for 12 hours. 
between crop cycles, and that seemed to be enough for cannabis aphid. But Parvus pinus is a tropical species, um, so I'm not sure how well that would work. And I think Sarah's point is very good that a lot of these bugs they survive through heat shock proteins, which are which are based on their prior experience. So if you can get them real cold to real hot real quick, that might work. I don't know how you would do that in a you would do that in a commercial operation. Um, probably like post harvest for shipping cut flowers or something. That might be that might be something to look at. I'm sure there's data out there for other thrips, but what I've seen with Parvus finus, there's not a whole lot out there. So I don't know. Good questions. A lot of homework. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, another one. Are there any native species of orias in Ontario? Yes, I feel like Kara, you should answer that. Yeah, I know. I was gonna say, I, yeah. I was like, Kara, this is a you. <laughs> yeah, we do have a couple. Um, our most common ones are Aureus insidiosus and Aureus tristicolor, and a lot of times they come in naturally. So, yeah, so that's another reason we're trying the bank banker plants uh, for Aureus. Is this farm that I'm working at is like most greenhouses in Ontario are surrounded by fruit trees as well. So we do get a lot of um, native aureus coming in. So that's kind of what we're hoping for some free aureus as well. Mm -hmm. Nice. Genetic diversity, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, okay, so there's um, someone who commented on how difficult it is sometimes to identify the separate antennal segments and perhaps there's a need for more training. Um, so there's a little plug there for <laughs> some training yep. efforts. We're thinking um, of doing a, a Thrips ID workshop and maybe recording some of it. So we can yeah. definitely work on that for you. That's great. Um, and then a couple of comments and questions about some of the magnifiers. So uh, somebody uses a 30 times magnifying jeweler's loop and a 60 times magnifying clip-on lens for their phone. And it often works well. Um, someone else is asking about, I think it was uh, Suzanne's slide, but Sarah's recommendation. Um, so what was the name of the clip on the phone magnifying lens? Oh, I think Suzanne's going to get her. So we're gonna get a live demo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, oh, Suzanne, your microphone's off. Oh, I yeah, didn't well, think I had to talk to show it to you. <laughs> What's the company name on it again? Oh, uh, it's on the top. Of the the model number is APL MS 2 CBK. If you really get into a pickle um, and you're in the United States, I can send you the link to Amazon. If you're in Canada, Sarah can send you the Canadian link. I think it was like. $32 US. 45 Canadian. <laughs> but yeah, I so far I've been happy with this. Uh, you know, I'm kind of a junkie for this stuff. I like it's rechargeable. Um, and so you don't have to worry about batteries. Mm -hmm. um, and I like that the lens is slidable up and down. So it fits multiple cameras and thicknesses. And I have an uh, not a super thick otter box, but I have an otter box on my phone, which has stopped me from using most other phones. I'm using a Galaxy S22 and it is working well on that. Nice. Thank you. Um, okay, another question about, can you share any tips about the right conditions when you're observing effective application of entomopathogenic fungus against thrips. So I think you were commenting about Bavaria, maybe uh, temperature. Yeah, you need high humidity. So like the temperature range is sort of, the ideal temperature range is sort of between 25 and 30, and it really drops off on either end of that, Celsius. <laughs> um, uh, somebody translated to American for me. <laughs> 80 American. <laughs> 80 to something, uh, 90, um, and uh, high humidity is what you're looking for. So basically like 80% is the ideal. You're not gonna get much efficacy below 60% relative humidity. Thoughts but, from but, others? Yeah, yeah, well, do remember that depending on plants and trans evaporation, but with tropical foliage, high trans evaporation rate, a lot of water going up, a lot going out that 
film right on the leaf surface. If it's not windy, you have almost 100% humidity on that leaf surface. There was an interesting webinar uh, by Stephen Juransky a while ago um, talking about Bavaria because he's done so much work with it. And I think he basically said when the wind is zero, it's 100%. But when your winds kick up to five to 10, your actual humidity on your leaf surface drops. So, you know, we know not to spray when it's windy because of drift, but also wind speed can make a difference in microclimate humidity on your leaf surface from the stuff he did um, with yeah, Bavaria. I and yeah, I remember that, Suzanne. And I was even thinking like a wind speed from a fan in a greenhouse is probably around five. Um, mm -hmm. So I know that a lot of growers here will use an LVM to apply Bavaria and things like that. So I think, you know, you're obviously shutting off the fans and the vent and letting the um, just the air currents carry the spores, so that might um, help increase, um, yeah, like you're saying, preserve the humidity at the leaf boundary layer. And I actually got a call from a grower this morning, and one of their concerns, which I didn't mention, but I'm going to throw this out here on why I think we need to incorporate these microbials even more, is because of all their spraying for parvi spinous, they think the side effect is all those product exposure to spider mites, and now they think they've made their spider mites more resistant to those chemistries they were spraying for parvi spinous. So as a side effect, they're getting resistance in their two spots. So this is, again, I can't say this enough, soaps, oils, microbials in the rotation to help extend these products because we need them to keep working, especially for really good cleanups at the end of the crop cycle prior to shipping. Um, because I, I would just I challenge anybody to go to any garden center right now and not find this thrips. <laughs> yeah, and I think one thing we've experienced up here in Canada and uh, Stephen and Suzanne, if you can comment on this, but like we've noticed that once we backed off on using chemicals all the time, the quality of the plants was so much better. Like pesticides are really hard on the plants too. We think the plants maybe had fewer flowers this year because of all the pesticides we did. So if we can get to a space where we're using, you know, it's more of a true IPM program, where we're using biocontrols and uh, microbials and things like that, I think the plant quality will stay up as well. Yeah, I mean, I see the long-term goal as insecticides or something that are used strategically at certain points rather than just pro as a routine requirement throughout the whole crop cycle, because that's just not sustainable. Um, and so that's why that, I mean, those charts you sent, you showed at the end, Sarah, were really nice because it gives a really nice sort of framework for how to think about this. Um, and uh, I was thinking the same thing. I just was not sure if you, but, um, but yeah, yeah. Back to the, the, there was a question about germination. Don't forget that the bovarious spores germinate on the insect, not on the leaf. So oftentimes, um, depending on the type of insect it is and where that insect goes, um, uh, humidity actually, coverage often is more important than, than ambient humidity in those situations. Um, but yeah. But yeah, we need more research on microbials for sure. Mm -hmm. um okay do banger plants work on thrips control and which banger plants are suitable for thrips control i think <laughs> there's yeah. been a few comments already but maybe you could yeah i think really it's just the research is ongoing we don't know what they're i mean yeah we're, we just need to keep going with this because it's always a balance with banker plants of are you increasing your natural enemies while not increasing the thrips so um, I think because this is a new animal, we just need to start from scratch, basically. The, the, the Mexican sunflower I mentioned, which was shown to be a very nice banker plant for native, well, not just native, but also released aureus, that grows, I think it's USDA zone 9 to 11, um, and it's a long flowering, it's only stuck, it flowers through first frost, and we don't always even get hard frost down in South Florida, so um, that one, I know that there's research ongoing on that, but I mean, aureus, like most asters, aureus like. And then you mentioned the Alyssa, which is a really great banker for parasitic wasps and things like a Fidelides. Um, I think having things around that can encourage aureus in your environment, even in outdoor nursery, just generally, even if you're not releasing them, um, although I would encourage people looking at aureus in for flowering crops, I think is really important. So, and it's going to be region dependent, like Sarah says. 
but the, yeah. well syngenta is going to kill me but i can't remember there's a, a ever blooming like summer long blooming sunflower that we're mm -hmm. using in um insectary plantings at one of my growers in north carolina and they are chalked full of aureus like every bloom has aureus in it and no i can't remember the name of it right mm -hmm. now um but that's something that for the warmer climates because again you know sarah and i go back and forth talking about you know how different florida is from canada even though now i'm parked in the middle i tend to spend a little more time a little further south um but finding plants that are more heat tolerant because we, you know listen taps out pretty early in the south because of the heat and we need these more heat tolerant varieties um so um i do need to get you guys steve and sarah the name of that plant because mm -hmm. uh it, it was and and this particular facility had not released aureus and it was gangbusters in there Um, okay, going back to really quickly that uh, question about the stomatas and the white blooms, there's <laughs> another comment here <laughs> explaining what they're talking about. So the type of plants I was referring to are succulent types, where the stomata tends to be recessed into the leaf. Now I can picture it. Um, for the whitish bloom, I was meaning in such cases as succulents where the leaves produce a whitish substance. We often call it a bloom. So, well, I'm um, trying to figure out what they're trying to control in succulents with the predatory mites. Right. But that's a whole nother. That's yeah. the next webinar. Next webinar. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, there's a question about using supplemental food with Aureus in the presence of Thrips Parvus Finus. So is it healthy yeah. to do that? In, in, um, in Israel, the standard program for pepper um, is to use uh, supplemental feed early at the transplanting stage in order to get uh, Swirsky, primarily Swirsky uh, established, but you can release Aureus much sooner than. Um, they, supplemental feed, I believe, is something that has a lot of potential to get early establishment. Sarah, Sarah talked quite a bit about um, using buyers early soon after propagation and there's the after dipping. So you're not going to have much many harvest finest. You're going to be spending a lot of money potentially on, on buyers and uh, a lot of them are going to die quickly. So using supplemental feed, I think, could be part of the solution. Um, and um, I think all of us would be interested in talking to growers about doing some different options. There. Um, I will say Julie, products, yeah. Juliet, mm -hmm. and I don't know the details. Mom would ask her, she said that this they didn't find for this particular thrips supplemental feeding was working for them. But I oh. don't know enough details on that. But that might be a good question for you to ask her because again, I don't know exactly what predatory might, what supplemental feeding overhead irrigation, sub irrigation, because there's so many variables that go involved. There's not one blanket answer um, because supplemental feeding can be much more challenging with overhead irrigation compared to sub irrigation. Okay. So there's still a bunch more questions. <laughs> Oh, you're muted, Sarah. Sarah. <laughs> I thought it was my computer. No. <laughs> it's my internet. It's yeah. frozen. I can't hear <laughs> I heard my husband come home upstairs, so I was muting in case I needed to yell at him to come down. Uh, I was going to say, let's answer maybe two more questions and then wrap it up because we're already 15 minutes over and our participants have gone down a little bit. But um, maybe we can collect some of these questions and put a ask the expert blog post up or something like that as a follow-up. I think that would be good. Um, I think that what the chat will definitely be saved for this. I don't know if the questions get saved, Kara, but we can. Yeah, I think they do. Okay. Um, report okay. So yeah, let's do dealer's choice, two more. <laughs> okay. I did, I did post the link for the Michigan meeting in the chat, but I don't know if the attendees can see that. But again, Sarah and I in Simber and Michigan are going to do a day long workshop, which I'm sure she'll post about all post about when we get more details, but we're going to go over a lot of the dipping, the straining the water, the tip 
da, 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 all that kind of stuff or hands-on stuff. Yeah, I just put that so everyone can see it, yeah. Okay, so I'm just shift, sifting through a few. There's a few questions in the chat. I think everyone can see the chat and there was a bunch of links in there as well, but... Um, Okay, can thrips parvospinus get into the leaf and create holes like thrips do on sweet potato vine before it unrolls? I haven't seen them do this. That that's a, um, I think that in that particular case, in the, the ipomia, there's just so much damage happening, feeding on that new tissue that it just weakens the leaf integrity then when it unrolls. It's not like the thrips has eaten it like a chewing insect, but they damage the integrity of the leaf so much the tissue just kind of falls out. But no, I have not seen that in with any of the, the parvy sinus stuff, parvy spinous stuff I've seen. And that's not super common in Ipomia either. Okay. Um uh okay, so I guess the last question. Uh, was any data gathered regarding thrips, thrips damage or populations existing on non-crop plants in the growing space, for example, weeds or nearby plants that might be harboring a population? Uh, all I can say is with um, the grower I was working with, there weren't, there were no weeds around. They were very clean, but um, they do seem to be very specific to these sort of big eight plants that we've talked about. Um, so in that one compartment with the six inch mandevilla, they had bougainvillea right across the thing with lots of blooms on them. You would find maybe like one every couple plants. I think they were just going over there to like sample them and then being like, Bleh, and coming right back. And that was like months and months of cohabitating and they didn't pop over. I have seen populations transfer to hibiscus, not at the bananas levels as on mandevilla, but they will go over and sort of stay there. And they did require a couple of pesticide applications, but it was way easier to control because they just weren't as bad. So I do think their host specificity on specific tropicals is in our favor. So there shouldn't be too much booping around. But I think that's different in Florida where there's some of like tro those tropical host plants in the landscape, correct, right? Yeah, that's a really, really great question, by the way. And um, the short answer is I, I don't know. and I. I I need to spend more time looking at weeds to see where they're coming from. The impression I get, and this is preliminary, the impression I get is that most of the uh, uh, source of infestation is happening in some cases between adjacent nurseries. When you have a high population, they might be flying over. But I think most of the problem is really those incipient populations that reproduce on the crop. And because um, you're rarely killing them all, it's the, where you see that real high pressure it's coming from one or two generations after an establishment in a crop. But I could be wrong and, and we don't know and it's a really great question and we need to know more about what kind of weeds because I bet you there's a bit that they can hang out on certain weeds and it just hasn't been documented because most of the plants that have been documented are uh, commercial varieties. I don't know, Suzanne, you got anything? Well, I just remember in tropical environments, the plants they're growing are the landscape plants. And, you know, one of my favorite things when I travel is surveying the parking lot. Um, I spend many a night walking around my hotel parking lots. And, and, and again, you can be a grower, you can do all the right thing. The wind just blows the right direction. You get new ones uh, coming in or you have a tastier plant. Because I do think what Sarah mentioned about like the hibiscus, because in Florida, we're not seeing it a huge problem down there, but she's had it. She's got pictures of damage. But I guarantee if you put mandevilla next to it, they'd probably leave the hibiscus and go to the mandevilla. So I think there's a lot of, of food choice selection that we need to, to still understand um, and who is the tastiest out there. And, you know, I hate to say it, but picking things that aren't super tasty until there are better management practices. I know that's what no one wants to hear, but, you know, at the end of the day, everybody's got to stay in business. Yeah, I think that's a great note to end it on. And um, <laughs> uh, thank you everyone for joining those who, of you who stayed with us to the end for questions. We really appreciate it. Um, 
stay tuned to the On Floor Culture blog. If we're going to have more thrips webinars, I'm definitely going to put up a lot of posts of this uh, more in article form. And yeah, maybe we'll do a Q&A of the answers, questions and answers that didn't get done today. So thank you all again and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. And thank you to our speakers again for coming and giving your time and knowledge to us. Thank you. Okay, Thanks for having me.